French Revolution was a pivotal part of France's history. A major player in the revolution was Maximilien Robespierre. Robespierre was, in a nutshell, the leading voice of the French government during the revolution and was largely responsible for the reign of terror. But let's dive a little deeper into the extraordinary life that was of Maximilien Robespierre. Maximilien Marie Isidore de Robespierre was born in Arras on the 6th of May 1758. He was the oldest of four siblings and by age six essentially had no parents because his mother died in labour, giving birth to a fifth sibling who barely preceded her. Due to the death of his mother, Robespierre's father became unstable and abandoned his role as a parent to travel around most of Europe, only very occasionally returning in Arras to catch up with his children. With no dedicated parents, Robespierre and his siblings grew up with their maternal grandparents. Robespierre didn't have to do this for long, however, because at age 11 he obtained a scholarship on recommendations with, of the bishop with the Louis Le Grand Middle School in Paris, so he moved to board there. Here he received his training as a lawyer and studied until age 23. As a young adult, Robespierre made a career as a relatively successful lawyer, making a name for himself by representing the poor and the humble. There was one instance when Robespierre defended an old man from the accusations of a spiteful member of the clergy and actually won the case, which at this time was a rare thing for a member of the Third Estate to win court cases against the Upper Estates. Robespierre soon started getting into politics, where his political views were supposedly influenced by one of his tutors at the time, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a renowned philosopher with revolutionarily new political views. Robespierre's view on France was a very Third Estate friendly view even at a young age. But still nothing of real note was happening in his life until March 1782 he was appointed criminal judge of diocese in Arras. But after a short time as a lawyer here, he resigned due to the fact that he was not comfortable with the death penalty, stating, I could not imagine sending someone to their death. 1788 was a stressful time for the French government because of a few things. After a massive volcanic eruption in Iceland a few years earlier, the climate over France had cooled quite a lot. It was actually considered a mini ice age. And because France had failed to move on from grain onto potatoes as a staple food, the harvests were appalling. This caused bread prices to skyrocket and the cost of living was higher as well, and caused much hardship amongst the common people. Apart from the general all-round bad harvest, peasants were beginning to become bitter about the unjust land distribution. Robespierre recognised this and actually sent a letter to the king, as many other people had done by now, with its spiteful aggressive content directed straight at the royal court, claiming... Do you know why there are so many needy people? It is because your luxurious existence devours in one day the substance of a thousand men. Another reason why the economy was beginning to fall apart was because of how bad France's financial situation was. King Louis' reckless spending had finally caught up with him and now he was forced to set enormously high taxes in an attempt to rectify the damage he had done. But this just made the people of France furious and starvation was starting to become a very common thing. With Louis' failed attempts at fixing France's financial problems, the banks forced him to hire a finance minister, Jacques Necker, who was a very prominent Swiss banker with a reputation that preceded him. Necker became very popular with the Third Estate because of the way he connected with the people. And in 1788, with France's enormous financial and economic problems, Necker urged Louis to call together for the first time since 1614 the Estates General. The Estates General was a meeting of the three estates where they discussed the country's outlying problems. On its own, it had no real power, but it acted as an advisory to the king and gave him more perspective on how his citizens felt about how he was running the country. As a young, successful lawyer on the rise, Robespierre was selected to be a member, or deputy as they were called, of the Estates General, and was asked to represent the Third Estate. Robespierre jumped on the chance. On 5th May, the Estates General convened for the first time in a hotel in the town of Versailles. The Estates General was only active for around a month, however, because in mid-May, the Third Estate, unhappy with the voting scheme, left the Estates General to convene on their own, creating the National Assembly. Not long after the National Assembly had been created, members of the first and second estates joined and the assembly started tackling the pressing matters at hand. Robespierre was becoming quite renowned with his 68 speeches in one year. He was always talking positively as far as the third estate was concerned, always opposing the restrictions on the press and often made it clear that all male citizens should be allowed to vote, not just the active citizens, who were the people who had enough money to pay their taxes 
and these people were becoming fewer and fewer every week. One of the biggest issues that Robespierre and his colleagues raised in the Assembly was the demand for the first and second estates to pay taxes. The first and second estates consisted of only 3% of the population, but were easily richer than the third estate and still only had to pay minimal taxes, if any. The third estate, on the other hand, was relatively poor and still had to pay very steep taxes. The first and second estates declined the idea on the spot. On July 12th, Camilla Desmoulins, a politician with direct ties to the press and childhood friend of Robespierre, made a speech to the public, urging them to take up arms and fight against their oppression. It was clear that his speech had worked because just two days later, the people of France stormed the Bastille, which was an old prison that represented the feudal system. They obtained a massive amount of gunpowder, which was essential for the revolutionaries' cause. They also freed seven inmates inside. It was considered a massive win for the Third Estate because they showed themselves that they could defy the king's word and get away with it, and now they had enough gunpowder and weapons to fuel a revolution. After the storming of the Bastille, the National Assembly was invigorated and inspired, and not long after the storming, a charter was granted called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Of this document, Robespierre contributed to many ideas and declarations. With the creation of this document, the abolition of the monarchy had essentially occurred, even if it wasn't yet official. With the National Assembly now leading the people of France, the more prominent speakers, such as Robespierre and Danton, began to stand out and create a greater voice for the people, and Robespierre finally managed to remove a majority of the restrictions on the press that he had so long been fighting for. Around the making of the Declaration, Robespierre was beginning to become interested in a religious order and political club known as the Jacobins. The Jacobins were an extreme right-wing political club and Robespierre's strong belief of a revolution being a necessity for the progress of France as a whole fell on friendly ears. In 1791, with many of the older members of the club leaving because they were shocked at how far the revolution had come, Robespierre and the other fanatics quickly dominated the club. It is still early 1791, and by now the National Assembly and the Jacobin Club have moved to Paris, and King Louis is forced to share his rule with the National Assembly, slowly signing away his power with every new law they pass. Maximilien Robespierre is now a very popular figure. He has unwavering morals, always speaking in the benefit of the Third Estate. His popularity was growing, always demanding liberty and equality in the assemblies, but one of his most imposing and strongest beliefs at the time was his disbelief in the death penalty. February 1792. Jacques Brissot, leader of the Girondins party and political enemy of Robespierre, proposes that France strike a preemptive attack on Austria because of the fear that family members of the royal family who managed to escape France will try to conjure up an army and attack France in a counter-revolution attempt to bring Louis back to power. Robespierre was one of the few people that argued against the idea because he felt that France wasn't ready to fight a war. They didn't have the resources or an army strong enough to defeat the Austrians and felt that the enemy would win. However, Robespierre lost the debate and in April 1792, France waged war with Austria. Now that France was at war with Austria, Robespierre committed himself to minimising the political strength of the military and the king. With France suffering terrible defeats, Robespierre started to see the possibility of the French military taking over the government. But Robespierre's fears were short-lived when news that a Prussian general who was joined the fight on the sides of the Austrians made a threat to the people of Paris, which is printed in the newspapers. This threat backfires terribly. There is a massive uproar. 27,000 peasants march on Tuileries Palace and attack the king's guards with a blind rage. Over 800 deaths occur on both sides. Louis retreats to the assembly for safety, but what is left of his monarchy is now dead with the rest of his guards. Louis' title as King of France is taken away from him and a French Republic is made. With France now officially a Republic and Robespierre inspired by the intensity of the time, he has a sudden change in heart about the death penalty. He feels that the birth of a new Republic should start with the death of an old monarchy. And on 16th of August, Louis is arrested and Robespierre proposes that the King should be put on trial. Louis is found guilty. There was not a single vote in his favour of innocence. Now the question was, what was his fate going to be? This question carried a lot of debate between the two political clubs, the Jacobins and the Girondins. But the Girondins were outnumbered by the fanatical Jacobins and King Louis was given the death penalty. The reason why the Jacobins wanted Louis dead was summarised very well by Robespierre during the debate. We have to kill our king if we want the revolution to live. If the king is right, then the revolution is wrong. 
Louis was executed on the 21st of January 1793. By now Robespierre was everywhere. He was a leader of the Jacobins club and a leading voice in the National Assembly. The time of the Reign of Terror was at hand. The Reign of Terror started essentially towards the end of 1792. With the monarchy now non-existent, a stable government was necessary to keep France from falling into chaos. A state of martial law was put into place, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and all its rights as guaranteed were suspended. Now Rosier and the Jacobins had essentially got control over France. Spies and police were scattered all over, and they listened in for anyone who might be suspected of counter-revolutionary acts, which could be as simple as eating with cutlery or complaining about how high the price of bread is. If you were accused of being a counter-revolutionist, you were given a quick trial and executed. The whole reason for this reign of terror was as an emergency government. It was designed to put terror into the hearts and minds of counter-revolutionaries and potentially scare them straight. On April 6, during all the bedlam, the Committee of Public Safety was created. The Committee of Public Safety was designed to give control of France to a smaller group. Now France was controlled by a democracy of 12 men. Robespierre was one of them and was soon found to be one of the more fascist revolutionary leaders. Robespierre still wanted more heads to roll. In the early days of the terror, Robespierre is considered one of the fiercest voices of the Committee of Public Safety. He sees no room for sympathy or mercy in the terror, as did many of his colleagues. But even so, Robespierre takes an idle step to the side to let one of the most radical revolutionaries, Jacques René Hébert, propose and execute the dismissal of the Catholic Church or the de-Christianization of France. Robespierre agreed with the proposal heartily, claiming that for the revolution to be a success and all the enemies of the revolution to be removed, the destruction of the Catholic Church was essential. With the dechristianization of France underway, the number of executions per month was beginning to exceed 800. Robespierre, realizing the mental devastation this must have been creating for the people of France, seizes the opportunity to instill a new religion for the people of France to adopt, the cult of the Supreme Being. With the installation of this new cult, Robespierre declares a new religious holiday. To celebrate it, a massive parade is held where a huge paper mache mountain is made and Robespierre was standing at the top of it wearing a white toga saluting the crowd. This made people start asking the question, who does this Robespierre think he is? Robespierre was beginning to make himself out to be something along the lines of an emperor of France, where people were beginning to think that Robespierre had become so consumed and fanatical about the success of the revolution that he had actually gone mad. Robespierre hears about these claims and his suspicions as to where these claims came from were aimed at those closest at hand. On June 27th, Robespierre delivers a threatening speech to the National Convention, claiming he has a new list of people who are considered enemies of the revolution, but he doesn't divulge any of the names on the list. The convention is outraged and shouts Pierre into stunned silence, so he leaves the convention. Robespierre returns the next day to divulge the names of the new found enemies of the revolution, but he is arrested before he has a chance to speak. He is taken to City Hall where he and his associates stay the night under armed guard. In the early morning, shots rang out inside the hall and guards rushed to find the source of the shots and find two of Robespierre's associates dead and Maximilien Robespierre lying face down on a table with a shattered jaw and a pistol next to him in an obvious suicide attempt. Robespierre spent his last few agonizing hours of life before he was executed, sprawled over the table that was used by the Committee of Public Safety in the very room where Robespierre himself had led France through the most violent and bloody months of the Reign of Terror. On July 27th, Robespierre is executed and with his death, so does the death of the Reign of Terror. Maximilien Robespierre spearheaded the French Revolution and was the voice of change for France. He contributed to many things in the revolution and some of them preceded him long after he was gone. What has to be the best thing Robespierre contributed to France was the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Even so, Robespierre will be forever remembered not for helping create the Declaration of the Rights of Man, but for executing thousands of innocent Frenchmen based on mere suspicion. It would be another five years until rule was entrusted with another individual, Napoleon Bonaparte. With a new emperor in power, the revolution ended, and with it, the ordeal that Maximilien Robespierre created. I won't bow down to no man.